North Korea has that. 32 out of 33 modern industrialized countries have that. How are you going to pay for it? We're going to be like North Korea. We'll have to borrow the money from China. Where are you going to find the money? Welcome to the show. To me, it's loud. I don't know about you guys. But anyway, I'm a little bit Now, I'm going to be doing uh, shows that are based on, a lot of them anyway, based on the content that is on realprogressives.org. So, I'm going to put that um, uh, link in the description below, and you can check them out for yourself. Read them at your, them at your own pace. But one of them is. Um, by a William K. Black, uh, quotes, liberal economist cheered the new Democrats' deregulation of finance. Now, I, I've been wanting to do a article, uh, show, whichever, uh, about, uh, the, about the, uh, repealing of a Glass-Steagall and the Dodd-Frank and in between, and before Dodd-Frank, which didn't really, which d doesn't do much as far as uh, regulating the uh, banks and separating them how they were at one point in time uh, before Glass Steagall was um, repealed. I think it was back in '99, and um, one of the reasons why uh, one of the reasons why I um, dislike the Clintons and. Uh, and a few other people, um, Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman being one of them, um, is the fact that when they, when they had repealed Glass-Steagall that allowed all the banks that wanted to get together and risk, uh, other people's money literally as far as that part goes, investments, hedge funds, hedge funds who, who basically are, um, organizations, uh, companies, incorporated, whatever, whatever have you, uh, that takes people's money and uh, does take risk with them. Not to say they all fail, obviously, if they didn't, if they didn't succeed in, in a lot of different ways for a big profit, the hedge funds would be around. They would be a, a they would be extinct. Um, but anyway, let's see. Uh, Apparently, this is the second part of the series, which I didn't really, I didn't know there was a first part, but anyways, uh, if there comes a first part, then I'll do that, of course. Uh, but anyways, actually, you know what? Let me see if, if they have the first part on, 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 on William K. Black's page here. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. By the way, he has uh, lessons. The lessons Richard Bowen's FCIC testimony should have taught the nation. Uh, that is for man, uh, April seventh, so a couple of days ago. Um, see, Trump and Barr unleashed a or unleash a lawfare assault on dem democracy, uh, which would be on, uh, notably September eleventh, twenty twenty. Is it? No, 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 no. This might be it right here. Uh, Hillary and Bill, uh, wait a minute, is this? Okay, I guess it might be. Um, this is from, uh, April 8th of 2016. Hillary and Bill and Paul Krugman raced to the right to stop the burn. Remember several weeks ago when Hillary Clinton was camp complaining, say campaigning, but complaining that Democrats did not consider her a progressive. Barry Sanders' big win in Wisconsin ended that tactic and propelled Paul Krugman and uh, Hillary and Bill Clinton to race to the right, no, uh, to race to the right, inadvertently proving Bernie's point that they are not progressives on the key issues. In the in the last week, Hillary and her surrogates have pivoted hard right and retreated to their long-held positions on the major issues. Indeed, in several cases, they have gone even farther to the right than the policies they pushed over a decade ago, even though 
Those policies proved disastrous. They also inadvertently demonstrated the terrible policies that were produced by the Clintons' vaunted, uh, vaunted uh, pragmatism and compromising with the most extreme Republican demands. That was the story of Clinton's infamous w uh, welfare reform, a policy both Clinton's championed uh, D Tom Frank details in his new book entitled Listen, Liberal, How the Clinton's Pragmatism and Zeal to Work with the Worst Elements of the Republican Party Led to the Welfare Reform Bill. Zach Carter has just written the article uh, I was planning to write about the travesty, he entitled it, Nothing Bill Clinton Said to Defend His Welfare Reform is True. I encourage uh, you to read it. As a criminologist, I am also an ad 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 advisor to Bernie on economics. I will begin my two-part series on Hillary's race to the right with Bill Clinton's effort to defend his drug law policies and Hillary's denunciation of black drug users as super predators. The second column explains Krugman's race to the right on banking and his effort to support Hillary's uh, harp pivot to right. Bill's defense of his policies that helped feed the mass incarceration of blacks and Latinos for drug offense uh, came in the same uh, April 7, 2016 campaign speech in Philadelphia that led to Zach Carter's skewing his defense of welfare reform, quotes. Uh, Bill's speech was strongly prote protested by Black Lives Matter members, which led to unscripted, angry attacks by Bill on some of the protesters and prompted his defense of his crime bill and Hillary's attack on super predators. Bill made four key points about crime in his attempted defense and attacks on the protesters. First, he claimed that his 1993 crime bill led to a huge decrease in crime. The reality is that street crimes were declining be before his bill, the trend and the trend continued after the bill passed. Elite financial crimes were surging due to the Clinton's champion of the of the, uh, of the three D's: uh, deregulation, desupervision, and de facto decriminalization of finance. But the Clintons and the authors creating and spreading the myth of black and Latino super predators ignored them. Uh, Second, Bill claimed that the bad parts of his crime bill were caused by Republican demands. Tom Frank's book shows how the Clintons' pragmatism and promises to work with the hard right led to him crafting a bill that produced the mass incarceration of Americans. This problem was compounded by his sentencing provision that uh, punished crack cocaine users a hundred times more severely uh, by weight than powder cocaine users. When the bill was drafted, it seems likely that the drafters did not know that crack cocaine was used overwhelmingly by blacks and Latinos and powder cocaine overwhelmingly by whites. A, a wide range of people eagerly uh, created what social scientists call immoral panic about crack cocaine even though its effects were the same of powder. Bill's uh, crime bill achieved bipartisan support, including Bernie. What Bill did not discuss, but what wait, what Bill did not discuss, but what Frank uh, Tom Frank's book emphasizes, is that the imminent immense uh, racial disparity in sentencing and the lack of on, uh, of any basis for it gives given the chemical equivalency of cracking powder become became clear within the year after passage of the act by 95 the u.s sentencing commission had gathered the data conducted the analysis and done all the drafting to repeal the disparity and bill and the republican congress promptly worked pra pra pragmatically and in a bipartisan manner to block the repeal of the racist sentencing disparity after he left office, Bill repeatedly apologized for his crime bill or crime act, but a few days ago in Philadelphia, he reverted to praising his disastrous law. He is moving exceptionally hard right back to his natural instincts when he gets off the script. 
third. <laughs> Bill moved so far right that he re resurrected a racist position Hillary had enunciated and later repudiated. Uh, Hillary attacked blacks who used uh, crack as super predators. That phrase was crafted as part of the effect or the effort to generate a moral panic in order to pro uh, produce the mass incarceration of blacks. CNN reported on Hillary's use of the term. In quotes, they are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators, Clinton said in 96 speech. When crime was a major public concern, according to polls at the time, in quotes, no conscious, no empathy, we can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. Unquote. That may not even be reading that right. Anyway. Hillary was quoting phrases from three ultra-right authors that were Reagan officials. None of them was a criminologist, yet they claimed that overwhelmingly black super predators, in quotes, were growing at such epic rates that we should be terrified by them that we would support a full-scale war, in quotes, against blacks, against black and Latino drug users. They did not simply coin the term super predators, and, and that, that's in uh, quotes, but, all, but stressed that they were primarily black. They called them, in quotes, feral, that is, the word used for a one t once tamed, tame animal that reverts to a wild animal. Black crack, uh, black crack users were de demonized as subhuman wild animals whose ancestors have once been tame as slaves and who, as Hillary demanded, must be brought to heel like trained dogs. Now this was true, but the racist lies succeeded in creating the moral panic that caused enormous damage to our nation. Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow uh, Mass Incarceration in the Age of uh, Colorblindness, is an excellent treatment of the shameful results. Hillary eventually, in 2016, recanted her adoption of the racist super predator, in quotes, phrase and meme. Bill is d disinterring it now because he got flustered and angered by the Black Lives Matter protesters and reverted in an unscripted fit to what came reflexively. Fourth, Bill uh, attacks the Black Lives Matter protest in a way that was unworthy of him. Indeed, his attack on them came directly from his bizarre effort to uh, support Hillary's use of the term super predator, in quotes. Months after she had repudiated that term, Bill invoked the same racist myths using the same racist language that was employed over a decade ago, even though they have been completely discredited by criminologists. CNN's report of uh, his Philadelphia speech notes. He also offended, uh, defended, well, you know, he's offended too, but defended Hillary Clinton's use of the phrase super predators. And quotes, I don't know how you would characterize the gang leaders who got 13 year old kids hopping up on crack and sent them out in the streets to murder other African American children. The former president said, Maybe you thought they were good citizens, she didn't. Uh, da -da. Bill also he seems to be channeling the inter interrogation scene from the movie *L.A. Confidential*. And it quotes, "Were you were you hopping up? Were you hopping up, Ray?" Plainly, Black Lives Matter protesters never suggested that uh, it was good citizens murder children. All in quotes. Bill's claim that they did show uh, did, did so shows how panicked he was by Bernie's big win in Wisconsin. Bill's story that gang leaders got a 13 year old uh, yeah, got 13 year old kids hopped up on crack and sent them to murder other African Americans is a racist myth. Even the ultra right authors uh, that invented the term super predator and described black crack users as akin to animals abandoned the term in their claims over five years ago. Bill has gone far to the right of the ultra-right wing by disintering this are these racist myths and claiming that they were and are accurate and making the uh, preposterous claim that Black Lives Matter protesters support those who murdered black children. In a postscript, 
how badly did Bill do on the crime and in on the crime in his Philadelphia speech? I've just found in Wall Street Journal editor that editorial that they have posted entitled in, in quotes in defense of Bill Clinton. The WSJ editorial team praises the Clintons for telling the truth about the super predators, falsely asserts that the crime bill is what reduces crime and applauds his black claim that Black Lives Matter members seek to defend those who murdered black children. Murdoch's min minions then instruct Democrats and black, and black Lives Matter agitators and other racist memes buried 30 years ago that the Wall Street Journal dug up for this editorial on why they should be praised are praising Bill's disinterring the racist fiction of gang leaders who got 13 year old hopped up on crack and sent them out on the street to murder other African Americans. Okay, so let's see. Hmm. Progressives at the time were happy to, to go along with Mr. Clinton's new democratic policies when center-right positioning seemed essential to winning the White House, but now they're too intimidated by Black Lives Matter to tell the truth. Black Lives Matter agitators should thank President Clinton to not exonerate him. When Murdoch's mouthpieces purport to tell the truth, the blacks and progressives uh, is a sure sign that they are lying okay so so when you go back and find the two part or the second part so that I could then finish off that part let's see oh, there we go okay da, da, da. okay just a wonder might be it let me just kind of double check on that yeah okay this would be the second part by the same William K. Black. The liberal economist cheered the new Democrat deregulation of finance. Um, okay, so this is the second part of the series. Uh, in quotes, liberal economists cheered the new Democrats deregulation of finance. This is the second part of the series on how Hillary and Bill Clinton and Paul Krugman have pivoted in response to Bernie Sanders' series of electoral wins and racing and racing hard right on finance and crime. In my first column, I wore a my criminology hat and quote on the hat to explain how Bill was de disinterring outrageous, uh, outrageously false and racist position positions that Hillary and he had once championed. This was all the more bizarre because Hillary and Bill had recently uh, repudiated those positions in the mid-1990s. Hillary and Bill sought to spread a moral panic, in quotes, about subhuman blacks or subhuman black uh, super predators in order to secure passage of the crime bill that led to mass incarceration and then to maintain the 100 to 1 disparity in the sentencing for crack versus powder cocaine once it was known that scientifically baseless sentencing disparity was leading to dramatic rise in the incarceration of blacks and Latinos. I also deplored Bill's false claim that Black Lives Matter protesters were defending those who murdered black children. In the second column, I provide a uh, contact essential to under understanding Krugerman's race to the right on finance. The readers are unlikely to understand how ultra-right wing and the economy policies were uh, of the Clinton administration. Bill Clinton and Al Gore were two of the most powerful leaders uh, of the New Democrats, a group of Democrats determined to move the party strongly to the right on economics, budget, national security, regulation, and crime. The new Democrats' policy apparatus <clears throat> was funded overwhelmingly by Wall Street, but its ideological uh, support came from economists who were liberal on some, uh, some social issues. The Clintons and Gore uh, delivered for Wall Street by embracing the three Ds deregulation, desupervision, and de facto decriminalization that encouraged and allowed uh, twin, wait, allowed, allowed twin bubble to rapidly expand. 
The dot-com bubble was the first bubble to burst. The housing bubble for a burst in late 2006, leading to the financial crisis of 2008 and the Great Recession that began in 2007. I discussed two articles illustrating how ultra-right the liberal economists of the Clinton era were in shilling for the pro-corporation policies championed by the New Democrats. Both articles were published in Fortune in spring 1999, roughly one year before the, spe uh, the, the peak of dot-com bubble. In the era, the magazine was proudly pro-plutocrat. Uh, the tone of economics uh, economists, excuse me, that authored the article was one of the pa uh, one of pandering to the plut uh, plutocrat's prejudices. It is also important to understand uh, the intersection of the uh, yeah, intersection of the econ economic and political context in spring of 1999. In the United States, Clinton took the extraordinary step in 1996 of nominating Alan Greenspan to continue to run the Fed. Greenspan was an uh, Ayn Rand uh, acolyte, originally appointed to run, to run the Fed by President Reagan. Greenspan was infamous as a supporter of Charles Keaton, the most notorious fraud of the savings and loan scant debacle. All of Greenspan's praise of Keaton's operations and predictions of success for Lincoln SNL, um, not Saturday Night Live, uh, SNL, um, proved catastrophically wrong. Greenspan had long, uh, long led an unholy war against Glass-Steagall, seeking to eviscerate through dozens of rule changes and interpretations designed to destroy its uh, protections. Greenspan was also hostile to using the Fed's unique statu statutory authority under the Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act of 1994, uh, or HOPA, to prohibit all lenders, including what Krugman now stresses were shadow firms and not normally uh, subject to federal regulations, or I guess shadow banks, um, regulation that specialized in making predatory and fraudulent loans, uh, uh, liar loans. Greenspan refused to use uh, HOPA to stop the predatory and fraudulent lending, even as it grew massively. Greenspan's successor, Bernie, uh, Bernie, uh, Ben Bernanke, another Republican who would be appointed by President Obama to continue to run the Fed after the financial crisis, uh, after the financial uh, crisis made uh, indis indis indisputable his regulatory failures also refused to use HOPA to protect the American people from uh, these predatory and fraudulent loans. He finally used the HOPA authority to adapt a rule banning liars uh, loans only in May of 2008. Roughly a year since the secondary market had died and liars loans had virtually deceased, or virtually ceased, excuse me. Uh, even then, he delayed the effective date of the rule until November of 2009, at least his inconvenience uh, any act, uh, active fund, uh, fraudulent and predatory lending. The uh, Clinton administration had already shown its uh, intent, uh, hostility to, uh, intense hostility to financial reg uh, regulation at the SEC, working with Republicans to block key reform efforts by SEC Chair uh, Arthur Levitt, uh, beginning in 98 and continuing in spring of 99. The administration successfully blocked the efforts of Brooks, Brooksley born efforts of Brooksley born to protect the global economy from coming problem uh, problems involving financial derivatives and later in 1999 passed uh, an act that forbade any future uh, regulation uh, from providing uh, such protection. The Clinton administration was working with the most conservative Republicans in Congress who effectively repealed the Glass-Steagall in 99. Citigroup and Travelers Insurance agreed to the largest merger in financial history in, in open defiance of the Glass-Steagall Act in order to successfully extort Congress to repeal the act. Robert, uh, Robert? Robert Rubin, the former CEO of, of Goldman Sachs, the government, the government's leader in destroying Glass-Steagall, announced that he was stepping down as Clinton's Treasury Secretary. He, pro he pro uh, promptly joined Citigroup. By 1999, even before the effective statutory repeal of, of, of Glass-Steagall, the, the banks that 
were first to take advantage of Greenspan's evisceration of Glass-Steagall and began to trade securities uh, were already suffering uh, severe losses. Liberal economists were the critical supporters of the Clinton administration's destruction of effective uh, financial regulation. Part of this effort was the uh, part of effort was deregulation, but desupervision was its even more destructive handmaiden. I have taken key excerpts from one of these economists to illustrate how far right wing they were. Okay, the first article, the author of the first article, which appeared in uh, April 26, 99, chose a deliberately uh, provocative title. Want growth? Speak English. That certain de, was it? Je ne sais quoi uh, of less was it anglophones? I uh, guess anglophones. Uh, the article made the triumphal assertion that speaking English was a key to a economic growth. That's not racist at all. The economic the economists ran through major English speaking nations and declared them great successes. Ireland had the highest growth rate. There's Ireland, the recent dubbed uh, Celtic Tiger, growing at an amazing 80, uh, 8% rate for the past five years. It should be clear that the economist was weak, uh, yeah, economist was weak on bubbles. He described the U.S. growth, uh, oh sorry, economist, Jesus, was weak on the bubble. He described the U.S. growth rate largely a product of the dot-com bubble with the same term he used for Ireland, amazing. Ireland's pro uh, property bubble would hyperinflate relative to its GDP to twice the size of the U.S. residential real estate bubble. The Economist, however, saw massive growth when he observed but did not recognize disastrous bubbles. The Economist uh, contract, uh, contrasted the great success of English-speaking nations with others. Latin Americans who thought they had put their past behind them are watching with horror as financial crisis strikes once again. The Economist did not mention that Latin Americans, though they had put their past behind them because U.S. economists had assured them that, when, that with their adoption of the mantra of English-speaking economists, Washington consensus of hard-right econ uh, economic policies, their low growth past were behind them. Instead, right wing economists championed by English speakers in the form of Washington consensus produced one financial crisis after another throughout Latin America, even as China was emerging as the growth champion and before, they, before that growth became dependent on bubbles. The, the economist pronounced English as the explanation for the national differences in great, uh, growth rate. What do the countries that have managed to remain prosperous while the world suffers have in common? Well, the answer is plain to the naked eye or make that naked eye a naked ear. Yes, the common denominator of the countries that have done better in this age of dashed expectations that, 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 the, that they are the countries where English is spoken. And this is, I guess, Alan Greenspan. Uh, okay, the, uh, the Economist Heroes. Alan Greenspan, Larry Summers, Margaret Thatcher, and M. Freedom, uh, Freedom, M. Freedom, M. Friedman. All of them failures in regards to actual economy, uh, economics. And actually at the same era, if you think about it. The Clinton administration and early Bush administration. Anyway, the economist was only, it was only getting started with his Anglo-Saxon triumphalism, there we go. He and his uh, colleagues made several explanations for the supposed triumph. First, the, uh, there's the Ellen Greenspan theory, or is it Larry's, uh, Larry Summers' theory? Economic policy in English-speaking economists, or ec economies, excuse me, tends, uh, tends to be run by smart economists with one foot in the ac academic world, who will therefore make better decisions than the doctrinaire um, mandarins, who run ministries of finance, and in a world where the rules have suddenly changed, the story goes, clever men and women who went to M MIT are better able to adapt the, than bureaucrats whose only expertise is in office politics. 
A slight variant in the Margaret Thatcher theory in 1980s, there was an ideo ideological uh, groundswell in the English-speaking world in favor of markets and against government intervention. Perhaps the rest of the advanced world misled the tide, uh, missed the tide, excuse me, because it couldn't read Milton Friedman in the original. One particular point that a friend made to me is that an email and the internet put people who use uh, non alphabetic uh, writing like the Japanese at a particular disadvantage. In 99, well after the collapse of its twin bubbles, Japan was the second largest economy in the world and China was already growing at such a high rate and so persistently that it would soon become the second largest economy. If using a non-alphabetic language is a critical restraint, uh, restraint on growth, then the Chinese and Japanese must be far better at economics than our English speakers since they have prospered so greatly while carrying the equivalent of third pounds, uh, 30 pounds of non-alphabetic lead lead in their saddles. But the economist missed the, lo the logical p flaw in his friend's speculation. The economist speculation that English-speaking nations had much had much faster growth because they put exceptionally brilliant economists like Greenspan, Summers, both appointees of Bill Clinton, as I said, and the economist authoring the column in charge of economic policy is revealing and humorous. It is hardly surprising that unsurpassable arrogance and Anglo-Saxon triumphalism became fellow fellow travelers. Similarly, it will surprise no one that an elite economist would champion the idea that the special brilliance of the author and a few of his fellow elite economists explain the unique success of the Anglo-Saxon nations. While well, MIT economists Greenspan and Summers are so brilliant that they explain America's high growth regulators and government officials are fools whose only expertise is in office politics, unfortunately, America places economist policy in the hands of Greenspan, Summers, and MIT economists and removes all authority from the inept bureaucrats. But what was the most uh, wondrous from a self-described liberal economic, uh, econ economist was his ode to Margaret Thatcher and Milton Friedman as likely explanations for asserted Anglo-Saxon su uh, superiority. What the economists never even considered was that the relatively high U.S. growth rates where they were considering in 1999 could be the product of the inflation, oh sorry, inflating dot-com and real estate bubbles. The second column by this economist appeared in Fortune on May 24, 1999 under the title The Ascent of Eman R.I.P. The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. The economist again sought, to, uh, sought a provoca uh, pro provocative opening. I grew, I grew up in a planned economy. T, uh, no, those who controlled the economies commanded heights. Its key industries were administrators rather than entrepreneurs. Conformists who were valued less for their productivity rather than, their, than for their loyalty whose career advancement depended on their political skill. For ordinary workers, the system had uh, some benefit. It was, ha it was hard to get ahead, but once you had a good job, your life was secure. Still, the economy was often appallingly insufficient and consistently unresponsive unre to consumer needs. No, I'm not an immigrant from Eastern Europe. I am talking about the U.S. economy of the 50s and 60s when General Motors was the very model of a modern uh, ma more major company. There we go. In those days, progressive thinkers like John Kenneth uh, Colbreth uh, used it to rid uh, ridicule economists who still believed what they had learned from Paul uh, Samuelson textbooks which was that free markets could be could be counted on to make a supply and demand after all businesses a uh, business and self was clearly moving away from the markets and towards planning by contrast in today's cutting edge e business as uh, you cover stories uh, the company uh, often owns a or rather rents a little but a little but uh, brain brain power 
Let's see. The villain in the piece is called as uh, a called breath uh, because he is a progressive thinker. The CEOs of big corporations are the man in the gray flannel suit. Too bland to be evil or even worth the, worth the, uh, worthy of blame. The old style CEOs who build firms like GM are dismissed with the economist classic insult as business bureaucrats. The hero of the piece is the entrepreneur. The, intrep the entrepreneur, whoever. Uh, <laughs> uh, the author channels uh, Ayn Rand and the most anti governmental economist. The, uh, the ultimate hero for the author was the CEO of one of the dot com firm staff with geniuses or nail workers. Note the non-persons in this tale. The ordinary workers, they they rate only two senses. There is no sense that they are important to the economy or even to the success of the firm. Instead, they, there is the muted recognition that the old system that Galbraith described led to a career for ordinary workers in which your life was secure. Uh, implicitly, the author is acknowledging that this will become a thing of the past in a new economy that he gushes about, rendering the lives of hundreds of millions of ordinary workers and their families insecure is not important enough to warrant express discussion. The economists treat their uh, fates as simple and uh, inevitables uh, in the order to achieve the brave new world. The firms and the SAR firms of the new ec uh, economy, Enron and Goldman Sachs. The article then turns to its real focus, examining the firm of the pinnacle of the economist entrepreneurial uh, pantheon that exemplifies the, bra the brave new world. The, br the retreat of business bureaucracy in the face of the market was brought home to me recently when I joined the advisory board as, uh, at Enron. A company formed in the 1980s by the merger of two pipeline operators in the old days, energy companies tried to be as uh, vertically inter integrated as possible to own the, hypro, the, the hydrocarbons in the ground, the gas pump and everything, and everything in between. And Enron does own gas fields, pipelines, and utilities, but it is not and does not try to be vertically integrated. It buys and sells gas both at the wellhead and at the destination, uh, leasing or leases pipeline and electrical transmission the capacity both uh, to and from other companies, buys and sells electricity, and in general acts more like a broker and market maker than a traditional corporation. It's sort of like the difference between your father's bank, which took money from its regular depositors and lent it out to his regular customers, and Goldman Sachs. Sure enough, the company's pride and joy is a room filled with hundreds of casually dressed men and room, uh, women staring at computer screens and barking into telephones where uh, cubic feet and megawatts are traded and packaged as if they were financial derivatives instead of CNB CNBC. Though the television screen on the floor showed the weather channel, the whole scene looks as if looks as if it had been constructed to illustrate the end of the corpora corporation as we know it. The author, uh, the author's gold standard of expertise is Goldman Sachs. The greatest compliment he can pay uh, Enron's leaders is that their firm is so superior to his competitors that it is the Goldman Sachs of energy. Enron paid the author $50,000 annually for what he would later describe as an advisory panel that had no function that I was aware of. Right? Who would share, uh, who would say no to trading on, on his self-described reputation for billions as a, as a MIT economist who get $50,000 from Enron for performing no function? The ideological uh, shift uh, leading, leading to the liberal push for deregulation. The economists then explained that, mo that, may, that what made possible this brave new world that he wrote to champion deregulation, he explained there, there, sorry, that deregulation was driven by a change in ideology. He explained to his readers that Adam Smith was right. The problem, the problem, the bloated bureaucratic corporation was caused by the government interfering 
of the markets uh, th uh, through regulation. With deregulation, Enron was leading the way in making free willing market possible. Markets possible. But probably the biggest force has been a change in ideology, the shift to pro market uh, policies. It's not that government has vanished from the marketplace, it's still a good guess that in a completely unregulated uh, phone market, uh, phone market, long distance comp companies would have buy up local access companies and deny their customers the right to connect to rivals and that the evil empire or at least the monopoly capitalist would rise again. However, we uh, what we have instead is a growing member of markets, phones, gas, electricity today, probably computer operating systems and high speed net access tomorrow is a combination of deregulation that, le that lets New competitors enter a common uh, carrier re regulation that prevents middlemen from playing favorites, making free willing markets possible. Who would have think? Who would have thunk it? The millennial economy uh, turns out to look more like Adam Smith's vision, or better yet, that of the Victorian economist Alfred Marshall than the kind of, than the corporatist. Future predicted by generations of corporate pundits. Get, it, get those old textbooks out of the attic. They're more relevant than ever. The economist who uh, authored the April and May 99 uh, columnist is, of course, Paul Krugman. The Enron Energy trading operation he gushed about was a leading center of Enron's frauds, particularly those that caused the uh, California energy crisis. Goldman has uh, admitted to what the United States found to have been massive fraud. Enron was indeed the Goldman of the, en the energy industry, just as Goldman was the en uh, en Enron of finance. The reader can probably Oh wait, sorry. The, the reader can now see Krugman's actual views when he found it profitable to pander openly to the plutocrats, defrauding the public and rigging the system against the consumer and worker. The reader can also see why he is so dismissive of criticism of Hillary taking enormous speaking sums from Goldman for performing no real function. Krugman's prediction that we were seeing the deaths of, uh, death of market power by huge firms proved as accurate as his claim that Enron and Goldman were the gold standards of their industries. Here is one of the ex exemplars we use in the book we are writing that explains that, that econ economics is the only field in which one can be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize proving Wrong is predictive ability or predictive ability. Well, let's see. Yeah, this is why I loathe the Clintons. This is why I loathe uh, Paul Krugman. This is why I loathe people like Larry Summers. Uh, every time they have something stupid to say. I get the, the itch, I guess you could say, to, at the very least, not only question what they're saying, but also look up and see uh, their point of view and find the obvious flaws and bring it back to them. It's kind of like when I uh, tweet Jim Jordan, who is not my representative. I, I'm kind of thankful, but kind of not, because it's, if he was my representative in Ohio, that means that I'd have the right to vote him out. But because he's not, uh, I can still hit him with the truth, and I just can't do anything about it as far as the voting bar goes. Um, not like not, not like that would help in the first place. But anyway, um, as someone who is, even though I have learned so much uh, monetary theory that has and follow people like Mike Norman, who does an excellent job in talking about the the, the links between the, the links of um, using monetary theory to uh, Wall Street or the markets or the economy as a whole, and helps people see um, what MMT sees as far as that part goes, and 
and gives people the knowledge to come back at the people who claim they know what they're doing. A uh, majority of people you see on uh, CNBC, MSNBC, and other places talking financially, uh, they they get paid money to speculate. They are speculators. They are people who have hedge funds. Um, you know, hedge funds, if you look up the direct definition of it, is quite literally a organization, corporation, whatever have you, that plays with other people's money. It takes um, high-risk um, investments and hopes for a high-yielding uh, return. Um, and that's not always the case, obviously. I would to be a lot more hedge funds, but... At the same time, you I would suspect that if you had a hedge fund, you would have to know uh, personally a lot of those who are involved in the, uh, in the investments that you are making with these people's money. Uh, you, would, you would have to know the owners of those stocks and bonds and other things like that and kind of make sure that, you know, either way, your customer that you are hedging for uh, doesn't lose a whole lot of money, at least not enough to dump you as the, as their um, hedge funder. I don't know how you really uh, look at that, but anyway, the point being is, uh, for those who are critics of MMT, um, MMT has shown a lot of people exactly what you're missing, and is able to come back with everything that you try to talk about. Uh, as a talking point and as a gotcha is not a gotcha is a got you as far as a part goes uh, <laughs> um, and I've been wrong on several occasions but I've noticed it I have acknowledged it and I've uh, and I've tried to learn from it anyway my point being is uh, support real progressives uh, I will be uh, downtown Columbus uh, Ohio and on the 15th, I believe it is, and uh, there's going to be another um, Roe, v. Roe v. Wade protest. I'll be at that one. Uh, hopefully, I can bring the, the right wire for making sure that my phone keeps a charge and be able to get that fully. It will more likely be on Facebook uh, with progressives. Uh, you can check that out that day. Um, it's 11 o'clock PDT, which for me is like 1 or so. I'm not sure about that, but anyway, I'll be down there uh, this coming Sunday, um, and there's another one, I want to say the 12th, uh, I'll, I'll try to be there, so there's other um, things I have to do that day, uh, but I'll try to be there, and same thing, uh, Real Progressives on Facebook, if you're interested in, uh, in watching, do so on Facebook, that's Real Progressives, and it'll be sometime that day that it'll be up. Anyways, thanks for watching. Um, support this channel by subscribing. Uh, support Real Progressives by going to realprogressives.org and looking up more of this author and everybody else that I have read. Um, I was going to read a couple, but I, but I realized that was uh, a part two of the series. So I wanted to read both. I will be continuing on with that tomorrow. So thanks for watching. Um, and yes, uh, support both. And you'll learn both. You'll, you'll learn a lot from both of us. Peace out for now. Thanks for watching.